today I have the pleasure um, to have, we have the pleasure to have uh, Ehud Altman uh, give the colloquium. I think Ehud uh, doesn't need much introduction. Most of you know him very well, but for the young student in the audience, let me give you a bit of details. So um, Ehud have been uh, in Weizmann already for 10 years. So yeah. Uh, Time flies. Uh, and uh, before that, he did his postdoc in Harvard and his PhD in the Technion. Eud is working in a general area uh, of uh, strongly correlated materials in condensed matter physics. Uh, and he typically, uh, typical to his style, he often um, goes into areas that even experimentalists uh, would not imagine. In many, many cases, there are experiments that have been done based on a theoretical pro uh, proposal by Ehud only and uh, which made a huge impact uh, just as an experimental piece of work. Uh, let me just mention a few of the big topics that Ehud made a dramatic difference in them. So the first one is the understanding of uh, bosons on a lattice, the quantum na nature of bosons on a lattice through experiments of interference, noise, <coughs> quantum quenches and so on. Uh, then uh, physics of bosons uh, out of equilibrium, for example, excitons is this uh, system, can you think about it as a uh, ground state system like uh, Bose condensate or not, so uh, in that field. He did major contribution in the physics of high TC materials and oxide interfaces. And the last very important work or a series of works that he does recently, and on this he would talk today, is the physics of many body localizations. So with this, I want to. I want to talk about a series of uh, works on uh, many body localization, and more generally on the topic of uh, quantum thermalization and relation to dynamics of entanglement in, in a quantum system. Uh, this was um, uh, work uh, that was done, uh, mo most of it was done together with a student here, uh, with uh, uh, Ronen Vosk, and most of what I'll talk about today, but not all of it, was also done with uh, David Hughes in Princeton, and there are a lot of other uh, collaborators that I'll mention on related works. Um, <coughs> so, although this is not necessarily a talk about cold atoms, uh, a lot of uh, what uh, a lot of it is motivated by, by experiments that are done and the outlook for experiments in, in ultra-cold atoms. So before I start, let me say two words about these uh, new systems uh, that allow us to investigate quantum matter. Here is an example of the first uh, Bose condensate uh, that was, you know, uh, was achieved in 1995. And very much more recently, uh, people are able to uh, make very precise measurements of quantum states uh, atom by atom uh, with uh, extremely high resolution. This is an example of uh, so-called quantum gas microscope where you see quantum states forming on the lattice uh, atom by atom in Immanuel uh, Bloch's group. And uh, so just to compare to regular solids, the uh, temperatures people reach here are of order of a nano Kelvin. Uh, uh, sometimes even less, uh, picokelvin, compared to one millikelvin to about room temperature in, in solids. Uh, the densities, however, are much, much lower. They're 10 to for, uh, 14 uh, atoms per centimeter compared to a um, few orders of magnitude higher in, in solids. So uh, because of that, actually, although uh, the temperature is very low, if you compare it to the natural degeneracy temperature in the system, it's actually quite high compared to what we have in, in usual solids. So you can ask, um, well, these materials are in normalized units very hot. Why, why are we interested in studying low temperature, many body physics using, using these materials? And um, there is several good, there are several good reasons, but the one that I want to focus on today is that they are different from all the solid state systems we know by being, uh, in being essentially closed systems decoupled from the external environment. And that allows to study new things that are impossible to study in uh, um, condensed matter, usual condensed matter systems. So we want to uh, utilize the fact that they're closed. And already there have been many studies utilizing that. For example, uh, you can put atoms in a lattice, like in this experiment, uh, 
at first confine them by an external confinement and let them evolve in time and study the many body time evolution, study effects of quantum integrability. You can basically very precisely engineer an integrable system, engineer its initial state and follow it, the initial state over how it evolves over time and see whether integrability is broken by small perturbations and so on. So people have studied uh, these kinds of effects which you can really not study in uh, um, condensed matter systems because they're always strongly coupled to an external environment or some junk that we have no control of. So it doesn't matter much for the equilibrium physics, especially the low temperature physics, but once you excite it out of equilibrium, basically this dissipation gives you all the physics. You don't get any of the quantum coherent dynamics of a many body system. So, okay, still you can say, well, it's a non-equilibrium situation with, you start in a very highly uh, excited state the system basically evolves into junk. So I want to, actually, my first goal is going to uh, be to define the questions that we can ask and get a meaningful answer to uh, in, in theory. So one of the uh, questions we can ask is w whether there are any genuinely quantum effects in the dynamics of a many particle system or the dynamics always becomes classical in some sense. And I'll define it more precisely. So uh, in, in, in one way to ask this question is why, our, uh, why is our ma macroscopic world, why does it appear uh, classical? Uh, because it is composed of quantum particles. And if you think of it as um, uh, closed, as a closed system, well, it should be quantum. Why is it uh, that it appears uh, classical? Um, is there any other possibility? Can it be quantum under some conditions? And is it related in some way to the fact that most systems we know, most generic many body systems, if you let them evolve over time, if they're in some high energy state, they'll come to thermal equilibrium. And that thermal equilibrium, we have some feeling that will make them essentially classical. And, and the question is how, how these things have to do with each other and whether <coughs> there can be a big quantum system that somehow evades this uh, classical or thermal fate. Uh, this is an example of the fate of uh, Schrodinger. Here, this is uh, uh, Schrodinger's grave. So when he reached uh, this uh, eventual boring classical fate. Uh, okay, so the outline of, of my talk will be uh, as follows. I'll first want to introduce and, and define what does it mean to be ergodic or thermalizing in a quantum system. And I'll discuss quantum systems that are closed quantum systems and they're a generic high energy states, not in their ground state. In that sense, uh, it's different from the usual paradigm of uh, condensed matter physics. It's not what we usually study in condensed matter physics. I'll look at generic high energy states. Um, so after uh, defining and understanding more or less what is ergodicity, I'll ask how it can break down. And I'll show that there is essentially one way we know that ergodicity can break down in a generic system, not in a highly fine-tuned system, but in a generic system. It's called many-body localization, and I'll, I'll discuss this. Um, I'll discuss many-body localization, what it entails for the dynamics, why the dynamics in a many-body localized system is essentially classical and not uh, quantum and not classical. And, and then my main focus of the entire talk is going to be the transition from many-body localization to a, a thermal fluid. And I'll discuss why this transition I think is very interesting and, and different from other phase transitions we know in nature. Um, and in the end, if I have time, I want to show you a quick uh, summary of an experiment that we recently collaborated on uh, in, that was done by Emanuel Bloch's group in uh, Munich using ultra-cold atoms and for the first time can confront some of these theories with uh, experimental data. Uh, this is only zero temperature? There is, no, as I said, there is no temperature. It's all out of equilibrium. Temperature is not necessarily well defined. And it's all in, uh, I'll define the statistical mechanics I'll work with uh, uh, more precisely, but it's all out of equilibrium and in high energy states. High energy states meaning it's a system that if it reaches thermal equilibrium, will reach thermal equilibrium at some finite temperature. Could be even high temperature. It's an isolated system, okay? 
Okay, so, so let me start talking about ergodicity. Um, this is a coffee cup uh, which starts in some initial state that is out of equilibrium because the milk is on top and the coffee is down and you see that it very quickly mixes and comes to some uh, maximal entropy state. And you can think the same in, in a quantum system. You can start a system of spins uh, where the spins are, are, these, are, are these things and maybe you can start two of the spins in some entangled EPR type states, state uh, where it encodes some quantum information and now you imagine having interactions between these uh, spins and letting these spins evolve in time. As they evolve in time, the natural thing that would happen in most systems you imagine would be that this entanglement between these two spins will not survive for a long time because this each of these spins will begin to get entangled with many many other spins in the system. So this, once this entanglement is shared by so many spins, it, it becomes irretrievable. You cannot retrieve back the quantum information that you've encoded in the initial state. Um, and because of that, the only remaining structures of information are not structures associated with local entanglement, but really slow modes of the system, like conserved quantities, order parameter fields, that are described by classical hydrodynamic equations. So this is, if you want, a short summary of why most of the systems we know become classical over time. They become classical because the only slow degrees of freedom that survive and are not messed up, washed away in the dynamics are, are the slow classical variables. Okay, so there was some. Uh, so the question is, if this is the case, how can we ever see persistent quantum correlations in quantum dynamics, whether there is any hope for that at all? Oops, what happened? It's quantum effects, but it's not quantum information. So if you encode, you take modes of the superfluid and try to encode in it a qu quantum information, tr try to entangle it, and try to make a quantum computer into, out of it, it will not show quantum information. The order parameter has a quantum origin, that's true. But the statistical mechanics and the dynamics of that order parameter becomes essentially classical after time. So, of course it's quantum, you, but in, because everything is quantum. But in the end, all this, these quantum effects become, the, the uh, entanglement becomes so spread out that there is no way to retrieve it back. And that's basically the irreversible process of thermalization. Um, okay, so I talked about um, the dynamics of entanglement, of, of, sorry, of, of ergodicity and how it has to do with entanglement. I want to say that there is an alternative way of viewing er ergodicity that has, you know, been around for a long time but became popular recently and, and, and that is looking at ergodicity and thermalization through the view of eigenstates and asking whether a single eigenstate of a, whether we can tell by looking at an eigenstate of a system whether that system is ergodic or not. Of course in experiment we cannot prepare a system in an eigenstate that is ridiculous but from, uh, the, from the theory point of view it's sometimes worth to think about this ensemble and there is a hypothesis called eigenstate thermalization hypothesis uh, that was put forward by these people a long time ago uh, saying that if I look at a thermalizing system and I consider any kind of local correlation, local correlation functions that are measurable in, 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 in experiment in, a, a, in an eigenstate, in a single eigenstate, then these correlations would be indistinguishable from uh, uh, correlations in a thermal state with that energy, okay? Essentially, that statement is nothing else but equivalence of ensembles, grand canonical ensemble, and the extreme limit of the, uh, of the micro canonical ensemble in w where you take the energy window to encompass only a single eigenstate and not a finite energy window, okay? And, and in that case, so another way to put it is that if I look at the density matrix, the reduced density matrix of part of the system, and I take this part of the system to be sufficiently large that surface effects are not important, but much, much smaller than the entire system, then in this case, this approaches uh, the canonical density matrix of uh, A, or grand canonical density matrix uh, as associated with just the system A. 
And in particular, if I calculate the entropy of that reduced density matrix, that is called the entanglement entropy. I'll use this. Um, so I take the uh, trace rho log rho of the reduced density matrix constructed for this subsystem S. SA, it basically f follows exactly the thermal entropy you expect for a thermal system of, of that energy. Now, this is, I'm talking about, this is the spectrum. I'm talking about the state somewhere here, somewhere in the gener generic part of the spectrum where the level spacing is exponentially small with the system size because of the many body uh, effect. So if you have n spins, the number of states grows like 2 to the n, the level spacing goes like 1 over 2 to the n, exponentially small. <laughs> However, look, note that the ground state is very special because the gap above the ground state is usually only polynomially small in the system size, or sometimes there is even an order <laughs> 1 gap. So that's, these states are special, and they have, if they're er ergodic, they have an entanglement entropy that actually matches their density of states. And, um, the ground state, on the other hand, has an entanglement entropy that is aerialo. It, it scales like the perimeter of the system. In most, generic, in most systems that are not pathological in some, in, in all systems that are not pathological in some way. There is no proof that all system, uh, all, all ground state, there are, are counterexamples, but I don't know of any gen generic counterexamples. The ground state is degenerate. Oh, it's not entropy of ground state, it's an entropy of a subsystem inside the ground state. So take a subsystem, calculate its reduced density matrix, and the entropy has to do with the fact that because you took a subsystem, it's entangled, take just one singlet and uh, trace out the other spin, you'll get that the entropy is actually log two, if, it's a sing if the two spins are in a singlet. So it's just a reduced density matrix of part of the system. But still, it's a zero entropy from the, it's actually zero entropy from the thermodynamic perspective because area law is, is not extensive, okay? So, and, and, entangle, and entropy is an extensive property. Okay, so the question is now, I told you what are ergodic systems, are there non-ergodic systems? Of course, all of you know uh, at least a few non-ergodic systems. Uh, these are um, integrable systems. So integrable systems are not ergodic, and there has even been an experiment with cold atoms showing an almost integrable system and, and how it's not ergodic. It has this uh, uh, mo strange momentum distribution induced by an initial state, and it never relaxes. The problem is that integrability is very fragile. It only occurs in very special fine-tuned points in uh, parameter space, and the question is whether there are much more generic non-thermal states possible. So in order to tell you that, I want you, I, I, there, is, there is a possibility, and, but, and, and it's related to something that's been known for a long time, Anderson localization. Anderson, although he actually was interested in many body localization, few people know, he solved the problem uh, of a single particle, and he, he looked at a single particle in a disordered lattice potential. Here there is no, nothing to talk about um, uh, uh, ergodicity because it's only a single particle, uh, uh, but he, he noticed that in any dimension, if I make the uh, disorder sufficiently strong, then that particle will not diffuse but become, will become localized in this lattice. And the idea of this localization is simply that if the disorder is sufficiently strong, I'll, I'll go into that in a bit more detail later, uh, there is a vanishing probability for that particle to find a resonant state elsewhere in the lattice. If this probability is vanishing, then it will not move away from its site. Now, um, what happens if you add interactions? I'm not talking about add interactions in the ground state, but now take the system to a, some generic state, localized state, now turn on interactions. Will the interactions delocalize you or not? One way to see that they will delocalize you is, is you can rewrite the interaction in terms of the localized orbitals of the non-interacting system, and you'll see that the interaction looks like hopping. So it hops you from one localized state to another. So that's one way to think about it, but there is an much more, I think, much more uh, correct and, and deeper way to think about it, that if you look at a single particle problem, the Hilbert space dimension is 1 over L. So this is where you have to search for resonances. Uh, sorry, the Hilbert space dimension is L, is proportional to the system length or size, volume. On the other hand, if you have a many-body system, even if they're not interacting, 
Strictly speaking, the Hilbert space dimension is exponentially large in the size of the system. But if the particles are not interacting, these, are, these Hilbert spaces have no, um, don't talk to each other, the single particle Hilbert spaces. So effectively, you're still in a Hilbert space of, one over, uh, of, of L rather than 2 to the L. The minute you put on an interaction, something changes dramatically. Your effective Hilbert space becomes from order L to order 2 to the L order ex exponentially in the system size. So uh, the possibility of finding resonances becomes unimaginably bigger. So one can think maybe um, this, uh, uh, and, and I'm talking about generic states, not the ground state, where you can actually find these states around in, in the spectrum. So, so one can think that localization will not survive this. Now, as I said, from one the point of view of dynamics has its uh, counterpart, dual par uh, part, in a point of view of eigenstates. And um, if I look at uh, eigenstate of a localized Anderson localized system, so it's single particle Anderson localization, I just put many particles, but they don't interact with each other, I can easily build an eigenstate and, and, and find the uh, entanglement entropy. And you see that because uh, the particles are essentially localized, the entanglement entropy is only contributed from the tails of the wave function that, extra, that, are, uh, that go out of, uh, of, of, of these boundaries. And therefore, it's area law entanglement entropy. It's not the thermodynamic entanglement entropy, not the volume law entanglement entropy of a, a thermodynamic system. So clearly, an Anderson localized system is not ergodic if I put many particles in. And the question we can ask is whether when we put in interactions, this entropy, the entanglement entropy, will immediately turn from area law to volume law or remain area law. So the stability of area law entanglement is another way to phrase this question of, of many body localization. But this is not really a closed system anymore. So Why it's not a closed system? Because you have disorder. No, no, but disorder is static. It's just part of the Hamiltonian. So that's a closed system. Uh, well, it's quench disorder. It's not uh, dynamic. It's, it's, it's like an extreme limit. Okay. With a much time sure. Time yeah. Scale. Yeah. So let's take their mass to infinity. Yeah. Sure. So so for, for every f uh, real system, there there is going to be some dynamics. It's so. Like an environment. It's not really different. Yeah. So let me let me look at uh, the mathematical question, and I'll show you that it is actually relevant to experiments of the, uh, when these impurities have infinite mass, and your particles are light compared to them. That will generate maybe in every real system your. Uh, but but still, you can say that you can ask whether in a closed system, even if there is no disorder, uh, there can be many body localization. But uh, nobody knows, and I think not. Uh, but but. I, Well, OK, but, but uh, let me take, at least for as theorists, we're allowed to take the limit of uh, infinite mass for the impurities. And you know, because the, uh, even in usual solids, in usual solids, it doesn't happen because the mass difference is not so high, and therefore there are phonons. So in usual solids, it doesn't. It, it, but in cold atoms, actually, it does happen because you, the potentials are created by external laser fields that can be uh, where that can be very strongly detuned from the atoms, so they almost have no inelastic scatterings with the atoms. So the time scales that you generate are much, much larger than the time scales associated with these uh, scatterings are, are orders of magnitude larger than the intrinsic time scales of the system. And therefore, in cold atom systems, you but actually, I'll address your, your question towards the end in a much more systematic way. Almost in a sense, I'll say it just in one sentence now. Quantum phase transitions, you can say, have no meaning because no physical system can go to, fi to zero temperature. However, they ex exert their influence. And you can see a, many a, a, a quantum phase transition, even at finite temperature, and you can measure its critical exponents. So although it's an unphysical point in parameter space, it's very important for understanding of the physics in physical parameter space. And it's the same about many body localization. Um, OK, so let me, I'm, I'm a bit slow, so let me run about it a, 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 a bit faster. Uh, so I didn't, I'm not going to tell you uh, exactly why uh, this system is stable. 
Um, I'm going to show you a, a toy model in a minute that will explain it somehow, I think. Uh, but, but there is a, a work, perturbative work, uh, by uh, Vasco Lenner and Altschuler and, uh, and also Gornier and collaborators showing that there is a stabil stability of the localized phase. And these people also emphasize the fact that is now a bit controversial that if you uh, look at the disorder strength, so if you look at some finite energy density, at any disorder strength, you will get some finite region before you get uh, delocalized. And then as you go up in, ener in energy or in temperature, if you want, the system will get delocalized. So there is some many body mobility edge uh, uh, and there is a transition between localization and delocalization. Actually, recently this has come, been called into question. question. It's not so clear whether this uh, line exists or not. There are arguments about it. What people agree about, and there is even a rigorous um, uh, proof, there, is a, there can be a transition at infinite temperature in a system with a, a bounded spectrum. So if you take a spin model, for example, it has a bounded many body spectrum. You can uh, seriously discuss infinite temperature. It's a state where all spin states are equally likely. And in that situation, you can change the disorder on, in the spin model and find an infinite temperature transition between a delocalized thermalizing and a localized uh, uh, non-ergodic phase. Um, I'm talking about any dimensionality, but I think the rigorous proof is only for one dimension so far. And what is the order of the transition? Oh, I'm going to talk about this transition. <coughs> I, I think uh, second order, I'll, I'll show you it to you. But it, that's not actually not well known. Uh, okay, so, so um, again, many body localization is the only exception to thermalization in a generic system. And I want to ask first, what is the nature of the dynamics in the localized state? And then address the issue of what is the nature of the transition and why it's interesting also. Um, so because my main point here is going to be the transition, I'll run a bit fast on this part. Um, uh, so, so people have looked at it numerically, looked at uh, spin models like that numerically. So this is a spin model that is essentially the same as looking at um, a random fermion uh, fermions on a random lattice potential. And what they computed is something kind of interesting. So they started the spins in a very simple classical state where the spins are e either up or down on every side. So it's a state you can imagine. Now you let the system evolve under this random Hamiltonian with the uh, random hoppings, random uh, on-site fields and, um, and interactions. This is called interactions because when you map this model to fermions, it becomes uh, um, an interaction between fermions without this, it's, it's one dimension, sorry. Uh, without this, it's a tantamount to non-interacting fermions. So you start this system in a non-entangled state. You can think about it as a state where the particles have precise positions. Uh, it's a completely non-entangled state. You let the systems, uh, system evolve in time. If you think about it as particles, the particles start to run off in all directions. Okay, and because they, when they cross some interface between uh, subsystem N A and subsystem B, because they're quantum particles, you don't know if they're in A or B, every time such a particle crosses, you get another log two to the entanglement. And because they have a characteristic velocity they go, through, uh, go in, then in usual clean systems, people expect to see uh, linear growth in the entanglement entropy, and indeed that is what is seen in um, clean systems. In, if there is localization, you would say these particles stop at some point and entanglement doesn't continue to grow. So it, doesn't, it would not continue to grow. And that, that is being checked. But the surprise was that actually if, if the system is non-interacting, it's like Anderson localization, this is the case Jz equals zero, the entanglement entropy goes up and then saturates to a finite value even in an infinite system, okay? However, uh, if you turn on even a weak interaction, what happens is that at some point, the entanglement kicks off again and begins to grow very, very slowly, logarithmically in time. So that was a kind of surprising result. And you can ask yourself whether this growth will continue indefinitely and then the system will eventually thermalize to the thermal entanglement entropy. And the answer, it doesn't. It goes up to some value. It saturates to a volume law entanglement entropy after some time, but this volume law is below what you have for the same energy density in thermal equilibrium. So the system still has degrees of freedom that haven't uh, fully thermalized yet. You don't go to the maximum entropy. Um, 
So that's, that's the uh, numerical result, and there was no explanation for it uh, some time. So now I want to uh, uh, just describe uh, in, a, in a qualitative way a different approach that we took and, and, uh, with, with Ronen. Uh, and so we started from some microscopic random Hamiltonian, and we, um, we set up a real space renormalization group approach which actually found, uh, which renormalizes this Hamiltonian uh, and shows that, well, it's a, it's a renormalization in a dynamical system. It doesn't integrate out degrees of freedom. The idea is that as you go to longer and longer time scales, uh, more and more of these uh, degrees of freedom become frozen and become effectively uh, emergent integrals of motion. So they, uh, this kind of uh, RG finds a fixed point that is, actually very uh, nice because it's, co it's written completely in terms of integrals of motion that com commute with the Hamiltonian and with each other. So in the end, we, we get uh, uh, RG flow with a fixed point that looks classical. Basically, you can solve this model immediately uh, because uh, you just, uh, uh, the eigenstates are simply um, uh, all the possible uh, eigenvalues of, of all these conserved quantities. Okay, so, so this is a classical fixed point, and it's very uh, analogous to actually most fi fixed points we know. Most of them are also integrable. It looks like there is an emergent integrability here. Um, Fermi liquid theory is an example. If you studied Fermi liquid theory, you know that Fermi liquid theory looks like this. It's, this is the non-interacting Fermi gas. Fermi liquid theory allows interactions, but only interactions which conserve the part quasi-particle number. The difference is that these conserved quantities lie only in a shell of um, measure zero in, in the full um, Hilbert space, while these operators are, are dense in Hilbert space. They're everywhere, basically. Sigma tildes are, so these are the original, okay, it's a good question. So these are the original spin operators. It's a very good, good question. Uh, sorry, I forgot to say, these are uh, local, really local physical spin operators. The idea is that these sigmas are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the original local conserved quantities, and in operator sense, in case of in sense of trace, for example, they have a finite overlap with their uh, correspondent uh, original spin operator. So if it's if if the uh, conserved quantities here are sigma x, each sigma x really corresponds one-to-one -one and has an overlap with the original local conserved quantity. So they're local in that sense. They're not fully local because each one of them has some non-local tail. So they could be something like sigma x times some weight plus some weight to non-local operators. But this weight for non-local operators becomes smaller and smaller exponentially with the size of the um, of, of this string. So, so this is like Fermi liquid theory. We arrived at that uh, from an RG, but actually independently at the same time, uh, people postulated this as, as the fixed point Hamiltonian, like the Fermi liquid theory. Yeah, uh, what was the question? They're all sigma x's, right? They're all community. In this case, they're all sigma x's. By the way, they could be all sigma z's. The difference is going to be very big if it's a model like this. This is the no Ising. This is the Ising model where there is a, a Z2 symmetry. Here I chose the conserved quantities to be sigma x, but I, as a function of these distributions, the conserved quantities could be actually related to sigma z's, which correspond to, which are odd under the Z2 symmetry. That tells you immediately that you can undergo phase transitions within the localized phase between a phase that sort of is a broken symmetry localized phase and the paramagnetic localized phase. So you can change the nature of the localized phase by changing the nature of the conserved quantities. And once you have such a Fermi liquid theory, such a um, phenomenological effective model to work with, then already you can find many results. For example, immediately comes out the log t entanglement growth uh, and, and various other anomalous relaxation of observables that is related to the log t growth but is much easier to measure. Uh, in, in these systems. It's a, an immediate result of, of uh, writing this uh, effective Hamiltonian. Uh, it also shows you that there are distinct localized phases, for example, broken symmetry phases, even topological phases. Um, 
you can also show from this, and also using numerics, we showed together with uh, uh, these people, uh, with uh, Yasman Bakhri and Ashwin Vishwanath, uh, that you can have actually protected edge states at the edge of these localized systems, protected um, quantum edge states that behave like spin ones, for example, and are protected topologically. That's very different from the usual topological edge states that are only valid at zero temperature, or in non-interacting systems. These are generic, robust edge states at any, that are valid at any temperature of the system. Uh, I, but I'm not going to talk about them too much today. A and the most important thing is that in this state, you can show that there is persistent quantum coherence. So you can uh, encode quantum information, at least locally, you can encode quantum information, let the system evolve in time, and using only local operations, retrieve it back as opposed to at least some of it. You can retrieve back after infinite time. That's, that you could never do in a thermalizing system, okay? You would need highly non-local operations in order to retrieve the, intera uh, the, the uh, uh, correlations. Okay, so all of this is very nice, but it cannot address the many-body localization transition. Actually, the RG approach, which I didn't tell you much about, is relying on the fact that there are no resonances that resonances are, are ineffective. So now let me uh, get into a bit more detail for a sh short time, but uh, a bit more detail on, on the physics of the transition. Again, we, I, show you that there, I showed you that there are two paradigms, many body localized systems in a closed system, uh, which are supposed to show quantum coherent dynamics, and they're a thermalizing system and they correspond to very different eig types of eigenstates. The eigenstates of the uh, localized systems have um, area law entanglement, while uh, generic states in thermalizing systems have uh, volume law entanglement. And the many-body localization transition is very interesting from both of these perspectives. From the first perspective, it actually gives you an, a, a sharp interface between quantum and classical in, in a macroscopic world. So the question is whether there is, in the macroscopic world, a sharp <coughs> transition between quantum and classical, and this is it. Second is that it's very different from phase transitions we know, because in terms of the eigenstates, you go from area law to volume law. Quantum phase transitions we know are all from area law entanglement, in, entangled ground states to another area law entangled ground state. And in high temperature thermal phase transitions, if I insist in uh, uh, thinking about them about in terms of eigenstates, they're really from volume law to volume law. So it's different from any other phase transition uh, we know. So the question is whether we can say anything about it. Can we understand the critical point? So in order to do that, um, how much time do I have? 15 minutes? What, 20 minutes? OK, good. It's enough. So in order to, so now I want to be a little bit more detailed. And all, uh, uh, until now, I, I told you story, stories, but now I want you to do some exercises. So, so uh, in order to understand this, I want to warm up with understanding first the essence of single particle Anderson localization. And I think that's, that's very neat and it's very helpful. So, so single particle Anderson localization is very easily defined if you uh, take this kind of lattice model where there is a disorder on site energy and you have small hopping between sites, okay? Uh, and this on site energy is disordered. Now, the question of um, localization is basically the question of whether there is a likely resonance within a range R of your initial site. So, whether this particle I will decay out of this site into the rest of the system, okay? You can ask this question as, uh, like this. So I'll, I'll show it in two ways. So uh, if I look within a range R, there are R, st R to the D states, okay? Because R to the D sites are R, R to the D states. The closest one in, they're distributed approximately you know, evenly. So the closest one in energy will be uh, this delta naught, the maximum uh, bandwidth over R to the D, over the volume, one over the volume, okay? Uh, on the other hand, the matrix element for hopping to this range is exponentially small in the distance because you need to go to rth order perturbation theory typically in order to go to that site. And therefore, unless uh, this hopping w times some geometric factor uh, is larger than the disorder, you'll not be able to do that. And that's Anderson's uh, criterion. 
uh, the resonance condition is j of r larger than delta of r. It's satisfied only under this condition. Otherwise, this exponential falls, this falls off exponentially. Okay? And, and this one falls off only as a power law. Okay? So you're never going to meet this criterion when you go to the thermodynamic limit. Uh, you can see this in another way that will be helpful for us. We can think about it as a decay, I told you, of this particle from, from one site into a continuum of sites. So we can think about it as a Fermi golden rule problem. I ask what is the um, matrix element to decay into a typical si uh, state at distance r. That's the matrix element I told you about, j squared times the density of states, which is 1 over the uh, uh, level spacing. So if you calculate this, then the criterion, so this is the Fermi golden rule rate. But remember, Fermi golden rule assumes that you decay into a continuum. You are really decaying into a continuum if the rate you have calculated is, gives you a broadening that is large compared to the discreteness of the levels. Otherwise, I can't do this because I have to take into account the fact that I have discrete levels. Okay, so if I look at this criterion, I get exactly the same as before. This is this resonance criterion, JR larger than delta. Okay, so, so this is another way to look at the same criterion. Now we're ready to go to move on to the many body problem. Okay, in the many body problem, I don't have a single particle. What I want, I have a spin system, a disordered spin system. I want to move between one configuration into another configuration. Okay, that's what I want to do. The matrix element to move into another configuration involves changing uh, spins over a range L, which involves flipping order L spins, and that's exponentially small, again, in, uh, in, in this distance, because you, I have to go to perturbation theory where I flip one spin, another spin, another spin, all these spins. Doing that will give me an exponentially small matrix element. However, now uh, the level spacing between the states is also exponentially small, because I have two to the L levels in my uh, many body system, spin system. So now I have to compare uh, the uh, gamma, uh, again, I can write this as decay of this state into the continuum, and I have to uh, compare j and gamma, and the resonance condition is that this g, which I call gamma over delta, I call it g, is uh, much larger than 1. If this is much larger than 1, I expect to, see, to have a delocalized phase. If it's much smaller than 1, I expect to have uh, a localized phase. Now, you see, if I, I wrote it in this way, where this exponential I wrote as e to the minus l over some length psi star. So, and, and the level spacing, because these are spins, is 1 over 2 to the l. It means e to the minus l uh, log 2. So this means that for the spin system, I require that psi star is smaller than 1 over log 2. If, it's, if this length scale exceeds 1 over log 2, then it looks like I'm dead, I'm going to be uh, to decay and be ergodic. Uh, so, so this su uh, uh, suggests the question that uh, Shimon asked, is this a first order transition? Because if this is uh, some kind of localization length, it cannot really diverge. So what I claim is, what I showed you now is a criterion for localization, but it's not really uh, describing correctly the critical behavior near the localization transition. If you describe this correctly, you will see that the, a second order transition is actually possible and probably the only possibility. So, so now I want you to, to show you a toy model for what really happens at the critical point, not a criterion for localization. So the toy model goes like, like that. So I want to have a thermal system of size L. Now remember this G of L is this uh, criterion, this uh, uh, gamma, which is still true, whether the decay rate is larger than the many body level spacing, okay? And let's say I have a system of size L, and I want it to be metallic. So if it's metallic, it must have G much larger than 1, metallic or thermalizing, uh, G much larger than 1. And now the question I want to ask, let's take three subsystems out of this big system and ask if I look at them individually, at each of these subsystems, must they all have G much larger than 1 in order for the whole system to be metallic? Or can I get away with something uh, more, um, uh, something better? And my claim is, yes, I can get away with something better. For example, maybe I can get away with something like this, where I have G much larger than 1 if I look individually into the left third of the system, the right third of the system, G much larger than 1, and the middle 
is a good insulator, G much, sm much smaller than one, G of L over three. I'm not, I, I'm not vouching for this one third, one third, one third. Maybe it's one, uh, one over a hundred and the rest are uh, metallic, but I can probably get away with the middle part being an, uh, in, uh, 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 an insulator because the sides act like reservoirs that thermalize it. Okay, it's uh, basically uh, um, uh, localized phase is localized as long as there is no external reservoir. At some point, the reservoirs, if the reservoirs are as large as the system, that's why I put approximately one third, then, uh, then they should thermalize it eventually. Okay, so, so this is what I want to run away, uh, get away with. Now, if I can get away with that, then I have to continue. Then what about this G much larger than one? Does it have to be all? composed of a microscopic uh, metal, well, I can do the same to this side, right? And I can put uh, metals only on its sides, they'll thermalize the middle and so on. And I can do another iteration and another iteration. And in the end, of course, what I get is a cantor set of thermalizing systems that are just enough to thermalize the entire system because of this cascade process, okay? This is a toy model. It gives me a fractal dimension of a Cantor set, which in this case, because I chose one third, one third, one third, it's log two over log three. Uh, and now you can ask, okay, so if I, I, I look at, now let's go away from this critical point into the insulating region. So now I'm an insulator, uh, my tuning parameter delta, this is a tuning parameter, for example, this order strength, in most of my system is, S the disorder of strength is large enough for the whole system to be blue, insulating, okay? But because of the disorder fluctuations, I can have a, a fluctuation away from this insulator into the critical state, okay? It's just a random fluctuation. This will be a critical bubble. But to create such a critical bubble, I don't have to change psi sites. I need to change less sites because this is a fractal region. I have to change n special sites, which is uh, uh, so this is the central limit theorem and how many I have to change in order to create such a fluctuation. And I have to, uh, uh, N special has to go like psi, like the size of the critical fluctuation to the power of fractal dimension. So from this kind of hand waving analysis, I see that I get a critical exponent. I can invert this relation. I get a critical exponent nu for the divergence of the localization length that diverges as a, uh, with an exponent two over the fractal dimension. And if I put in this fractal dimension of the toy model, I get 3.2. Okay, so remember this uh, number, uh, 3.2, because now, well, I told you a toy model. In fact, we, what we did uh, together with uh, Ronen and with David Hughes is, is we formulated the real, uh, real space renormalization group that acts in the space of, uh, uh, on a, a model that has, uh, many of these uh, regions inside the system, these regions could be either insulators or uh, metals, and they're uh, represented as random matrices. And the question is when they start to join together, whether they will thermalize each other or really make each other insulating by proximity effect. And both processes can occur. And there is a renormalization group uh, scheme that joins them and tells you in the end of the renormalization group, you see that, uh, so during the renormalization group, more, more and more uh, matrices are joined together into larger blocks. And you ask yourself at this level, whether what's the distribution of insulators and thermal uh, states inside your, your system until in the end of the RG at the fixed point, you have just one big matrix with uh, a G, uh, this criterion that is either much larger than one, which means that you've reached a fixed point of a, um, a metal or much smaller than one, in which case you reached uh, an insulator. So that's the idea of this RG. I'm not telling the details, but the, essentially the spirit is the, to the spirit of the toy model I, I just showed you. And you can see that it can go to two of these um, uh, uh, points. So this is log G as a function of the average length of clusters. As L grows, you go to larger and larger length scales. And you see that in, as you tune some tuning parameter associated with the initial distributions, you can either be in a localized fixed point where this goes down linearly, which means G goes down exponentially, or it goes up uh, exponentially, which means it's in a delocalized state. 
Okay, but now you can, go, you can go ahead and calculate things from this. It turns out that this G can be, there, you can make a, a direct relation between G and a quantity that is essentially the entanglement entropy of half the system. So you can calculate that. Uh, these RG rules we just simulate on the computer, but it's not very hard simulation. You can simulate for hundreds of thousands of sites, and you can go from 100 sites to, uh, here it's 10,000, actually I think we, get, we went all the way to 100,000, and you can compute this entanglement entropy of half the system as a function of the tuning parameter. This is the tuning parameter that ta takes you from uh, insulating on this side to thermalizing on this side, and on the y-axis, uh, the solid curves correspond to the entanglement entropy over the expected thermal entropy, which is extensive, of course, okay? So in the insulating side, you see that it's zero, because uh, volume law over area law is zero, uh, and uh, on the insulating, on the thermalizing side, it goes to one. So it actually goes to the thermal entropy, as you expect. But you see that as you go to, uh, uh, larger and larger systems, the jump becomes sharper and sharper, and you think that maybe you can scale this. this uh, these curves, by the way, correspond to the fluctuation of the entanglement entropy. When you scale these curves, so you, you can scale them by taking, do finite size scaling by uh, taking the x-axis and writing it as uh, the tuning parameter minus some critical tuning parameter that you postulate is one free parameter times L to the power of one over nu, which is the um, uh, uh, critical exponent. When you do that, you see that they all beautifully curve, uh, uh, scale, and the um, other moments of the entropy also beautifully scale on top of each other. And you see that indeed there is a universal jump of the entropy and it's perfect data collapse for nu equals 3.2. What I gave you for this uh, you know, strange toy model. So I, I, I don't know if it's by chance or that this toy model really captures the, the true behavior of, of, of the RG. This is, of course, not put in by hand, 3.2. This is the calculated critical exponent in the RG. Uh, and you see how the en entanglement entropy, so, so how to read this curve. If you're to the left of this point, uh, it, then you're in the insulating side and you see that you always go to zero. If you're in the right of this, then you always flow. Flow means go, as you go to larger and larger scales, you always go right, you always go to one, and the fluctuation in the entanglement entropy always goes to zero. There is another interesting point, you can check what happens exactly at the critical point, and you see that exactly at the critical point, there is, a, it's an infinite randomness critical point that's described by a, a, a broad, the, broadest possible distribution uh, of entanglement entropies. So entanglement entropy turns out to be the best scaling variable for this uh, RG, and it turns out to be maximally uh, distributed at the critical point. Um, one more thing is you can, that you can study is uh, transport. You can ask, because entanglement entropy is not something we can measure very easily, you can study the transport, and the first thing we wanted to, to ask, what we can get in the RG is we can, get, we can look at the system size, L, and we can ask what is the transport time across the system, okay? And if there is diffusion, the transport time scales like L squared. We can measure both in the RG, so we can plot, for example, the, trans, the length as a function of the time, and we expect to see these curves that have uh, um, slope one half, and, and the offset is d, and we can see how d goes to zero at the critical point. The uh, surprise initially was that this is not how it happens. You see all these curves, as I change the tuning parameters, parameter, what changes is not the offset, but the actual slope, <laughs> which means that uh, it doesn't go like diffusion, but there is an exponent alpha less than one half here, or if you want z uh, uh, more than two, and, and this alpha, exponent alpha, dynamical exponent goes to zero um, uh, uh, continuously at the critical point, and we also have a very, there is a very clear model for how this happens. Uh, it was also, by the way, seen by exact diagonalization studies. The way it happens is, is because of rare events, it, I'm, I'm not going to discuss it, but, but one can have a very good model for how it happens and even predict from, based on this model that this alpha should diverge, uh, sorry, one over alpha, uh, which is the dynamical exponent z, should diverge at the critical point like uh, the uh, uh, correlation length diverges at the critical point. 
And indeed, when we scale this, we see divergence with an exponent. Uh, the slope here is how it is, is the slope of the divergence. It goes like uh, 3.1. Uh, uh, so, and remember that the exponent for the correlation length was 3.2. So it's very, very close uh, to this. OK, so basically, that's all of what I wanted to tell you about theory. And in the last two minutes, I'll just mention that uh, this is very uh, theoretical. But very recently, um, there was the first experiment uh, done in a cold atom system with Emmanuel uh, Bloch's group in, in Munich. Uh, this was a collaboration also together with Mark Fisher, who is here uh, a postdoc, and, and Ronen Vosk. And, and the idea, I'll just tell you the basic idea of the experiment was extremely simple. You start, uh, they can precisely create initial states in a lattice with disorder. In fact, it was not exact disorder, it was quasi disorder, but it's not so important for this uh, for now. Uh, and you can start with an initial state on a lattice of atoms on a lattice, which, uh, and in a way that you put atoms only on the even sites and no atoms on the odd sites. Okay? It's a very high, high energy state. It, if it thermalized, it would go to essentially infinite temperature. Uh, and, and then you let it evolve in time under this Hamiltonian with quasi-randomness, not exact randomness, and interaction. And, and you can probe as a function of time how the imbalance between even and odd sites behaves. Now, if the system is ergodic, then it, the even and odd sides will balance each other after a long time. The imbalance between them will go to zero. However, what they find in the experiment is that the imbalance actually uh, saturates over a very long time compared to the um, uh, natural time scales of the experiment, which is a direct measure of um, direct measure of breaking of ergodicity. And they can plot now a phase diagram of where the ergodicity is broken and where it is not broken. Uh, not going to. You can see more things that they haven't looked at, but we already looked at in, in theory, which is, for example, how various observables relax and how you can see quantum effects from the relaxation of observables. Um, and the last thing that is still an open question and we're studying with them now is what Zora said is always in any system, this disorder is not going to be perfectly quenched. And even in this cold atom system where it's more quenched than any other uh, more frozen than any other system we know. If you look at it at very long times, actually now they even improved the experiment. You need to go to here order, maybe almost on order of magnitude more, but then you can see that there is a small decay of these uh, uh, effects. And, and this is exactly because the lasers of their experiment are actually fluctuating themselves and cause uh, scattering on them. There is another effect that they looked at 1D tubes, but these 1D tubes have very weak coupling between the tubes. And at very long time scales, this starts to take effect because we have, this, is so, this phenomenon is so uh, sensitive to uh, coupling to an external bath. But what we're trying to do now is impose dissipation from the outside on purpose by adding another laser that can add dissipation on purpose. And that would be, so here is this ideal point that we're interested in. It's the critical ergodic to non-ergodic transition. And now if we can change dissipation by hand, by coupling to a bat, then we can study uh, the universal crossover that occurs here. It's not, no longer a phase transition. Um, just like you study quantum phase transitions at finite temperature. So there is much more to be done in these experiments. Uh, this is the experimental team uh, with Emmanuel Bloch and uh, theory. And uh, this is my uh, summary slide. Uh, I've shown you that there are two possible uh, states, uh, two possible paradigms for dynamics. Uh, one is many body localized, the other thermalizing. Um, there is a dynamical renormalization group that uh, shows that uh, many body localization can be viewed as a, dy as a dynamic, uh, dynamical fixed point of the RG. And there is a different type of uh, renormalization group approach that can uh, describe the critical point and, and, and predict the sub-diffusive phase uh, to the right of the, the, in the ergodic side of the critical point in one dimension at least. So, and there are many open questions. Do we have a more microscopic description, uh, theoretical and numerical approaches to treat uh, quantum thermalization? Uh, which uh, we are working on uh, right now. So thank you. So we had a lot of questions during the talk, uh, maybe a few questions going. Can you just show one point? Oh, yeah, this one. Yes.
Yes. So this point, the ideal point. Yes. Is supposed to be, let's say, similar to the IG models in a random magnetic I don't. I don't think so. It's very different. I, you, you mean uh, it's a quantum phase transition? You you were talking about the classical transition of an. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. infinite disorder fixed point. Yeah, yeah. The, the, so, okay. So, infinite disorder fixed point. It's a quantum phase transition of a random random transverse field Ising model, and it's very different actually. So, there is also another exponent there called uh, psi. For example, in the uh, the Ising. Uh, critical point has, um, if you look at the critical exponent uh, uh, new associated with it, it satisfies exactly the Harris bound. So it's exactly 2 over d. There is no fractality there, if you want. While r does, is above the Harris bound, there is a non-trivial fractal structure of the, and, and that be, that's because there is no duality between the ordered and disordered phase here. Uh, so it's, it's different. There is another exponent associated with how the system flows to infinite randomness, where there it's half, and in our case it's one, so there is there. It's not the same fixed point. Is it uh, identical to say that the state is many body localized, so that the thermal conductivity is zero? Is well, it the same thing? no, no, absolutely not. Because, for example, I showed you a case uh, of the ergodic phase, non uh, delocalized, where the thermal conductivity is zero. No, I meant to. The thermal conductivity is zero. Yes, but it's not the defining property of it because you can have a state with a zero thermal conductivity, but still transport which is subdiffusive. Uh, that's ergodic. I, I think it's not a defining property, a, and maybe in higher dimension it is. Uh, uh, there is another point. You can have a many-body localized phase even in a, a Floquet system where energy there is no energy conservation. So then, then you can't really talk about thermal conductivity at all. But I think here the subdiffusion we find is actually pretty special for one dimension. In in this guy, in this, I, I don't know what's the uh, scenario for the transition in higher dimensions. I'm not sure it will give subdiffusion. That's, uh, but but in any case, uh, in uh, uh, higher dimensions, may, maybe in some cases it is. But in general, I can kill all the conserved quantities and still define many-body localization in terms of uh, entanglement thermalization. Can you have a many body localized phase in which uh, is the thermal conductivity? No, no, no. That, that, that is, yes. Well, that's what was said. The 3.2 uh, number that you figured that you got, in the thermal model it's quite arbitrary, right? Because you define ah, yeah. it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it doesn't, no, no, I don't say it has, I mean, the 3.2. You know, frankly, I actually chose the three because it gave me the right uh, exponent. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but it also sounds plausible because, you know, you want the bath to be, there is some, any, any choice will give me some fractal dimension, like, uh, unless the choice was exactly nil. If, if I, I, could, I needed to have the entire system um, uh, uh, ergodic in order to have the system, the full system ergodic, then I'll get a fractal dimension of one, okay? But, but I, I think this is very unlikely because we know if we put a few sides, and I think from doing some numerics, it looks like one third is in the ballpark of what you, what you have. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so I, I don't, it, it doesn't, it's not meant, this toy model is not meant to give you the exact exponent, but to, under, to give you a feeling for what is the process of thermalization here. Okay, so this yeah. is